don't get caught up in this notion of the individual genius. It's never, it's never that. It has to be a community for this to work. And I think that we need to be more honest about that as colleagues and as academics and as historians. Welcome to Drafting the Past, a podcast devoted to the craft of writing history. I'm your host, Kate Carpenter, and in each episode, I talk to a historian about their approach to writing. This time, I'm talking to the brilliant historian and American Studies scholar, Devarian Baldwin. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Dr. Baldwin is the Paul E. Rather Distinguished Professor of American Studies at Trinity College. He is the author of two books. The first, Chicago's New Negroes, Modernity, The Great Migration, and Black Urban Life, came out in 2007. The second, In the Shadow of the Ivory Tower, How Universities Are Plundering Our Cities, came out last year with bold type books. We'll talk more about both of these books, along with Dr. Baldwin's many other projects, including essays, lectures, and a few surprises you're going to hear about. Dr. Baldwin has appeared everywhere from CNN to the Washington Post to the Daily Beast. Among his many honors, he was awarded a Logan Nonfiction Writing Fellowship from the Cary Institute for the Global Good and was appointed a distinguished lecturer for the Organization of American Historians. Yeah, it's interesting because I didn't start out as a quote-unquote historian. Uh, my undergraduate degree is in philosophy. I took history classes and hated them. Uh, they were, <laughs> <laughs> it was, I, I just felt like it was a bunch of facts and dates. And then my last semester of undergrad, I took a, um, an intellectual history course and it was driven by stories. And I was like, this is history? You can do this? And then I went on to get a, um, a, a PhD in American studies, which is a more interdisciplinary engagement with, you know, literature, history, cultural studies, particularly where I went to NYU. So it's, it's, I've always, from the writing side, have always been confronted with the uh, reality of figuring out how to appropriately layer archive theory, narrative, idea in different ways, you know, trying to figure out um, different approaches to scaffolding has always been um, something of a challenge. And, and some of this is rooted in my, in my growing up years in the sense that um, for various reasons, I was incorrectly slotted into a second or third tier writing class and as a young person, and I had to fight to be put in the advanced level courses. And that happened after taking the courses that we're supposed to receive based on, you know, like on, on the writing fundamentals and infrastructure. And um, I was doing spelling bees and things of that nature. So when I got to the advanced level courses, I didn't have the training. And so I felt like even to this day, I'm still trying to play catch up to that loss, those lost opportunities to think about in a methodical way, mm-hmm. the nuts and bolts of, of writing. I've always written the way I, sp- I've always felt like speaking was my strong point. And so I've written the way I speak and lecture and I've kind of had to reverse engineer an approach to writing. How, how have you done that? I think, you know, by reading a lot, <laughs> reading <laughs> other people's work that I really like, talking um, about writing and teaching and, and figuring out, you know, in the ways that I try to convey to students what I consider to be good writing, um, that has been a, a, a mechanism by, whereby I have taught myself how to become a better writer. Um, I also think that when I shifted from, shifted from, being, from an academic press to a trade press, having different editors that have discussed with me the craft of writing or different orientations of the different kind of presses has made me sort self-aware and, and self-conscious in a positive way, in a productive way, <laughs> about <laughs> the, the craft of, of writing and the capacity to convey ideas in a compelling um, way. What, what kinds of things have you found that editors respond to or draw out that have, have changed the way you think about writing? So, so from very, you know, basic things like um, strong, captivating um, uh, opening sentences to uh, how to convey the experience of a character, how to build tension, how to place the relationship between like placing direct quotes versus um, summation and there, you know, and, and it's, it's, you know, in some ways, it's a struggle between like the academic side of the compelling nature of your writing comes from the bombardment of facts <laughs> as compared to crafting sentences that try to generate an emotional response. And so in that case, the facts are important, but how are you delivering them? How are you, how are you building up to a conclusion? 
become more interesting and uh, more vital. I'm really interested that um, you sort of talked about how in, in academia, often we think in the terms of this bombardment of facts. And one thing that really struck me when I read Chicago's New Negroes is that you tell beautiful stories in that book while mm-hmm. also preventing such a strong argument and theoretical theoretical argument, I guess. And, uh, you know, I was struck early on, you were talking about the challenge of layering those things together from Mm -hmm. the different disciplines and stories and argument. Can you maybe talk a little bit about how you do that? I mean, or how you approach it? Yeah, it's funny. I'll say a little bit about that, you know, because there's a big big difference between my first book, Chicago's New Negroes, and my latest book, In the Shadow of the Ivy Tower. And in that early period of my writing, coming out of cultural studies, Birmingham School of Cultural Studies, and having a philosophy undergraduate degree, I was very arrogant, and I saw uh, narrative writing as, as a contrived crutch. And I'm mm-hmm. like, I'm not doing that. I'm I'm a theorist, and I'm about the I- <laughs> the, the purity of the ideas. And you know, while, while I had these great figures like Jack Johnson and Madam C. J. Walker and Thomas Andrew Dorsey, I was like, you know, they're only there to the degree that that they can convey my point about how everyday people produce ideas. I was less interested in kind of offering these mini portraits of the scholars. And thank God my editor at the time, Sean Hunter, who was at UNC, who is now in Florida, was saying, you know, she did it in a gentle way, but saying, can you say a little bit more about these figures? <laughs> and so I, I'm definitely thankful for that. But in the moments, I think it's important for people to understand where I was coming from is that, you know, I wanted to, to reconstruct experiences through of the making of ideas, how people made ideas, everyday people, not academics, made ideas through these dense composites of overlapping experiences. And I think very quickly. And so the, the, key, com- the key approach to me in the writing was density, speed, agility, and word bending. Those were the things I wanted to do. And, and those come out of the fact that I have a background in spoken word. Mm-hmm. And I said before that in times of writing anxiety, I fall back on writing the way that I speak. And at the time, the way that I spoke, living in New York City in the spoken word you know, mo- moment um, of the early 90s was density, speed, agility, and, 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 and word bending. So that's the way I want to convey. And, and it, was, it was further, I guess, compounded or, or encouraged by this desire for me. I wanted readers to see the messy architecture of my thinking, mm. but, but also you know, the working out of intentionality and the intellect of everyday people. So, so I wanted the writing to reflect the degree to which people were processing experience and ideas. I wanted that to be reflected in the writing itself. Mm-hmm. And that came out of my spoken word background. And it, it took me a long time to, to realize, though, that in spoken word, I can augment the speed and tone mm-hmm. of, of my conveyance with voice and performance. But when it's on the page, it's on the page. It's left to the it's left to the to the reader to do that, and so you know I had a mixed it was a mixed experience. Um, people that read that book love it to, to a certain degree, and and because of the density, because of the the messiness of it, because I was purposely trying to be experimental to invoke to channel the culture of the folks that I was talking about. I didn't want to just show; I wanted to tell. I wanted to, wanted to you know show and tell that what I was showing, what I was talking about was reflected in how I was writing about it. Mm-hmm. And I think that it was, you know, mixed results. You know, I, I had to, it took me a long time to realize that maybe the text, for what I wanted to do, the text wasn't enough. Mm-hmm. That there are ways in which sometimes the meaning of the text came out more clearly in my lecturing about it. Mm, interesting. Or in my engaging about it. Also, I think that because of the density and the speed of the writing, it's just taken a long time for people to actually process what was actually going on. So, like, that book came out over 10 years ago. And, you know, thank God people still read it. And people that I knew me then, they're saying, you know, you know, now I get mm-hmm. what you were doing. I think also part of it was that at the time when I was writing it, it was at a moment where cultural studies was direct, was beginning to interface with history in a more direct and pronounced way. Now that's become more normalized. And so the approaches that I was taking in the book don't seem as foreign or difficult. But at that early moment, it was a challenge. And, and so the, it was mixed results in terms of conveying that element. But, you know, there are people like, I could say it, it was the text, but I also could say it, maybe it was me. You know, I was still <laughs> growing as a writer, and I'm fine with that. Because when I think of somebody like Greg Tate, rest in peace, the amazing cultural critic for years who was at the Village of Voice when I was in New York, um, he was able to convey both the messy and the clean, mm. the intentionality and the emotive force. I mean, I think it re- it requires a certain kind of capacity to be able to balance 
all that, the scaffolding, you know, it's really a skill to learn over time. And I don't think, I, I think that my, the, the mentors in graduate school, they were experts at doing it, but only some of them were experts at teaching it, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, I also think that, that books as compared to essays are written for a season. And I think that writers need to understand that, yes, the books can be timeless. And we all have that ambition for a book to be timeless. But we also have to em- em- embrace the fact that maybe books, all books, they can become timeless. But what they actually are at their base is they are written for a season, for a moment. And for me, I can look back now with greater narrative chops and say, maybe I would have written that Chicago New Negroes differently. I would have, I would have leaned more on the characters and character building. But at that moment, I wanted, I was grappling with this interface between the theoretical engagement of cultural studies and the archival uh, richness of history and trying to speak to fields, trying to speak to, you know, this is my dissertation. So I was trying to speak to fields and trying to make intellectual history confront this different way of thinking about the work that you're doing. And so showing how culture work, popular mass culture, things that historians think are corrupted by the marketplace. Trying to show them, you know, in my work that these things may have been quote unquote corrupted, but they also became these amazing vehicles for especially African American working class migrants to think through their world, to to develop a political understanding of their surroundings, and to create an intellectual life. And and so it was written for that purpose at that moment. And I, I don't have regrets about that. I'm I'm happy with that. And I think that for um, for students, for graduate students, it serves a purpose to see someone thinking through a process without the fear that it doesn't demonstrate perfection as a published work, that it is an experimental piece. It's, it's more the composition than the performance. It's the notation and, and, and being okay with that. So as he mentioned, there's a big difference in style between Dr. Baldwin's first and second books. And I asked him to tell me more about how his writing has evolved over time. I think the nature, number one, I knew that because of the nature of the story and the politics of the work that I was doing within the shadow of the Ivy Tower, I wanted it to reach a wider audience. Mm -hmm. And so I purposely went to, you know, a trade, a trade press or a, a boutique trade press, if you will. With that, I knew that it would be a different genre of writing, and I was very aware of that. I mean, but even in my, even in my, you know, leisurely slash academic life, because we never have a fully leisurely life, you know, when we read books. But I love, you know, I I read a ton of novels, and my favorite kind of novels are science, speculative, and uh, police procedurals. And I read them as for pleasure, but I also read them as a writer. How to build you know, build out narrative. And, and my, my editor at the press was very clear. She's like, you know, this is going to have to be a narrative driven project. And I knew that going in, but I, I embraced the challenge, you know, of that. But at, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm, I am a thinker. I'm a, you know, I am a scholar. And I think that that, com- that, that comes out too. It, it took me coming to terms with the fact that no matter what I write or no matter how narrative I write, that other part of me is never going to go away. <laughs> sure. it, might, it might seem overly narrative to me, <laughs> but for the lay reader, it's going to read as pretty, it's, it's still scholarly, <laughs> <laughs> no matter how hard I try to be something else. So the balance that I'm, that I'm fighting for will, will be there. Um, but I do appreciate, you know, like I appreciated this book in the sense of like, you know, there weren't as many, foot, there, was, there were more footnotes than most mm-hmm. trade books. But there weren't that many footnotes that it was about the text. You know, writing this book has also kind of frustrated me with the academic writing world. My newest project, there was a piece of it that I submitted to a to a major journal, the Journal of, of American History, and I didn't. The response to that pr- that piece was pretty harsh, and the mm-hmm. biggest concern with it was that I didn't spend enough time on the literature review, or what we call the historiography. And it, it just hit me in the sense of, after I'm coming out of this more narrative-oriented writing project and this public-facing work, and the, the, the idea that I had to catalog all the things that have been said and written on this topic before I could get to the actual topic was so frustrating to me. And I kind of made a statement to myself that, you know, I'm not probably, unless it's commissioned or invited, I'm not going to submit any more work to an academic press anymore, to an academic journal anymore. That's not the way I want to write right now. Now, that might change later in life. I might go through a different season. But at this point in my, in my career, in my life right now, that's not the way that I want to write. Mm-hmm. That I don't want to have to demonstrate. 
I want to, of course, I want to acknowledge the work that's been done, sure. but I don't want to go through a catalog of, of all the things that have been written to, the, to, to give me the legitimacy or the capacity or the ability to then say what I want to say. And so that was just really striking for me because I never thought that, I never thought that would happen, but that's happened in the afterlife of this book. So I want to back up a little bit and, okay, and ask sure. you some of my, my nosy questions about just the sure. basics. Where and when do you do your writing? <laughs> When I was younger, I definitely get, uh, gravitated towards writing at night. I'm a night person. So for me, there, even though the morning is quiet, there's a certain kind of quietness in the night where I felt like I was the most productive because I went to grad school in New York and, and like office space was a high premium. I wrote and worked in coffee shops. So even to this day, I'm more productive in, in, the, in the daytime in very dense, noisy coffee shop environments, even if I have my headphones on, just that ang- that energy around me. So it's that um, as I've gotten, when I had started having kids, my kids are older now, but but they still have, you know, schedules that are more <laughs> involved than mine. <laughs> um, <laughs> so now I write anytime I can. It's hard for me to do, like there's some people who have the everyday grind where there's certain hours a day where they write. And I, I wish I had that kind of discipline. I don't. I I still hold whole paragraphs in my head and try to, you know, narrate per- perfect phrases in the, you know, in my head and then let them hope they spill out, you know, that's, <laughs> that, you know, that's, that's the ambition. That's, that's what I, that, that's my, I guess my mechanism for, for, for procrastination. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's still at the end of the day, it requires me to, okay, sit down with the, with a blank screen or a page and just grind out. I, I, I think in phrases and I think in terms of titles, I'm, I'm, because of my backgrounds in philosophy and big ideas, I, that's the way I think. Before I can start writing narratives or, or crafting sentences in a more detailed way, I like to have titles or concepts that will drive my thinking forward. Mm-hmm. Everybody's not like that, but that's what works for me. That's what keeps me excited. That's what propels me forward. And then I build it out from there. How do you approach sort of organizing your sources? Yeah, so I, 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 most of my writing career, life has has been in the in the days before EndNotes as a <laughs> as a program. <laughs> so early on, my sources were just a hot mess, and I <laughs> I did what other people had to do in terms of like I would have sources, I would write, and then not keep a good catalog and have to go back and find stuff, and it would take a, the 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 time of writing a whole new book to go find the sources again. And as time has moved forward, I've gotten better with keeping track of sources and. You know, as I'm going into writing project and I'm doing research and talking to people and going to archives, you know, organizing, I still don't, I still don't use programs. I still do it the old school. I'll have a Word document or whatever, keep sources, but I also catalog pictures. I'm like, oh, this would be a good picture for the book. I'm doing that, all those things in, as I'm researching, as compared mm-hmm. to with the first book that all came after. <laughs> <laughs> so I definitely recommend, you know, so there are these amazing programs that are available now to catalog and keep track. And so I would say, I would recommend use those. But even if you don't use those, I would say, take note and organize your notes as you're researching. And I also think that it, it, it enlivens, it, it, there's ways in which you can enliven your writing when you can be in direct conversation with your sources and your materials, with your, with your images versus waiting till the end. You know, another great writing, probably one of the best, greatest writing tips that I've ever received which is, was very useful to me because I'm, I'm a, you know, serial procrastinator. I keep trying to keep, like I said, keep all in my head. And it comes with this relationship between notes and sources and writing is that, you know, many, many historians or many scholars have this, this, this other anxiety that you, you don't want your argument to overwhelm or shape the sources. You don't want to overdetermine the findings and make them fit to your conclusions. Mm-hmm. And I totally understand that. But one of my colleagues, it was a great advice and it happened later and later in my career was like, okay, you've done all this archival work. So you know what the sources say. And in your head, you kind of have an idea about what you want to say about the sources. So it's not just about an imposition or, 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 you know, shaping the source to meet your conclusions. The sources have spoken to you. You've done the archival work. So after you've done the archival work, Outline the story you want to tell in 10 pages. Hmm. Build it out in 10 pages. Just write it. And then from there, build out the architecture of documentation, of imaging, of source material. And it's, and it's, and, and despite what you may think, it's not cherry picking. It's not shaping to meet your argument because you've done the archival work. And that's been so helpful to me. So now at the beginning of a writing project, after I've done the archival work, and I write those 10 pages where I just 
throw out there what I, the story I want to tell. And, and because I've been, just been in the archives, a lot of the story I'm telling is actually driven. I'm actually referencing sources. And then I build that out to, you know, 30 or 40 pages. Mm-hmm. And, that, and that was a lifesaver for me, just in terms of time, um, in terms of being able to spend more time on the, the scaffolding that my kind of thinking and writing requires, um, in terms of, you know, theoretical, com- theoretical engagement, uh, methodology, uh, narrative. So, yeah, that, that was a lifesaver. And, and I continue to, to, to use that approach and share that approach with other people. And then what does revision look like for you then? Yeah, I try to write a whole draft before I even think about revising. I mean, of course, you know, as you're writing, and for me, because I, I, I'm big about, you know, the sentence, the sentence craft, I'll go back and like, I'll, ha- I'll, you know, keep a notebook by my, by bed and I'll, you know, sentences will come to me and I'll write down the sentences. It's not so much about the fact of the sentence, but the, it's, the, it's the phrasing. So I might go back and rephrase sentences as I'm writing a chapter, but the big revision, I won't do that until after the chapter is done. Or I'll have a full draft of a chapter. Also, I, I've over the years I've been blessed with you know teams of friends that uh, colleagues that will, will read, and so after I finish the draft, the first draft, I'll send it out to them, and at the same time that they're offering revisions, I'm revising, and then I'll get their revisions, and it allows me to um, pick and choose the things I like and don't like about their comments, and and we'll be in conversation, and that's I've been really you know really really grateful to people that have been able that have taken time, and I think that's another thing as well that people need to understand is that even though public facing side of the academy will will not just communicate but will celebrate the notion of these individual great geniuses it's never that i know writers who have who hire editors separate editors for notes for line editing for concept like have separate editors for each one of those things i know individual writers you know many award-winning writers who have a writing team of colleagues that they and they and they all they'll pick one of their one of the one of the members of the team and they'll circulate that project through the whole team. Don't get caught up in this notion of the individual genius. It's never it's never that. It has to be a community for this to work. And I think that we need to be more honest about that as colleagues and as academics and as historians. In your process, at what point do you get other feedback on it? Yeah, after the first draft. I mean, I'm, I might talk to my f- friends about, you know, this is what I'm thinking, what do you think, ideas. But the actual feedback from the work comes right after the first draft. I, I want to, at some level, have some sense of, sense of completion to write that chapter and then send it out to friends. And that's really helpful because sometimes, even as I'm doing revisions myself, it's too close to me. I can't see outside of it. And so even as I'm revising, I'm glossing over assumptions that need explanation because I wrote it. I, I, I know what it meant to me. And that's something that was really important to me as I moved from the first book to the second book and from academic to trade presses is that that spoken word ethos that I had, I, it took me a long time to even know where that, what that was, where that came from. I want, and, and you read the first book. And so, you know, talking about, talking about independent filmmaking and gospel music and all these things, I wanted it to be dense and complex and, and fast paced and I wanted it, there to be conversations between the different figures and their and their work. I wanted the writing to reflect that that pace, that that messiness, if you will. But with this book, it was a different kind of desire and tension. I wanted people to be compelled. I wanted people to engage. I wanted people to act um, from the work. By the nature of the press that I was working with, it gave me the chance to to rethink and to revalue the notion of slowing down, of letting sentences breathe. Um, one of my tendencies, <laughs> even to this day, is I, I, I love series, you know, <laughs> in sentences, this, 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 and this. And in this book, I still think I probably do it still too much, but I was very intentional and methodical about taking every series that I put in a sentence and turning each one of those clauses into its own sentence. I think that's been good and effective. And just also just giving the reader, because I, I think very quickly. So giving the reader a chance to think with me instead of, again, trying to hit them with all this stuff. I think I still do that. And I think that it works orally in a way that it doesn't work textually. Did you know for this piece going into it that that you were looking for a non-academic press, a, a more public facing press? Yes. Nope, I did. I knew that I wanted to go to a more general audience, general audience press. I mean, the funny thing about it is that when... I sent, submitted everybody in academia was like, oh, yes, this is definitely going to be trade. This is going to reach a, a wide audience. When I sent it to some of the really big 
trade press. They were like, nah, it's still too niche. Um, mm-hmm. So even so, it's funny because even what we as academics think about as being broad might not, probably won't be broad to the publishing world. <laughs> <laughs> but then there were those middle kind of boutique presses that do like social justice work, that do academic and general audience presses, new press, free press, nation books, which is now bold type books, which is, like, which is who I went with. Presses like that, they totally got it. And they actually said to me, like, which I was at first against, they were like, you know, I was like, I don't want any footnotes. I just want to just tell the story. And like, no, this this is rich enough. And it's it's wonderfully researched enough that it can still have an impact. We wanted to have a general audience impact, but we also think it can have an impact in the in the scholarship. And the way to do that is to have the footnotes. So again, even though I'm living it, I'm now being confronted self-consciously with, you know, the architecture of different genres of writing. You know, that for for general audience readers. For them, academic press in the one in one level signifies the footnotes mm-hmm. because then that generates your bona fides with your academic community. And so they're like, we want it to, to be to be narrative and you know, shorter sentences, um, giving the reader a chance to 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 learn with you, to show and not tell, to not necessarily hit the reader over the head with the conclu- with the conclusion that you want them to have, but to build the story so that they are come with you to the conclusion. So there's all those things, but then for them it's okay, but we want this to have an academic uh, legitimacy too. So we're going to let you have more footnotes than we normally would. <laughs> and so that was just funny to me. I just, I didn't think about it that way. And it was, it was, it was a learning experience for me. You write in a, a lot of ways. So like you said, you have sort of a background in spoken word, you have written books, but you've also written essays for a more public audience, including op-eds. I think you're also working on a, a digital based project um, mm-hmm. that maybe you could talk more about. But I'm wondering how you think about all those different forms of writing and, mm-hmm. and if it's hard to move between them. That's a great question. Um, actually, one thing I'll tell you about, I'm actually writing the text for a puzzle. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's a puzzle <laughs> on the Harlem Renaissance. And um, I'm writing the text. I'm really excited by that. And, and the reason why I mentioned that is because it came with a certain set of writing challenges, you know. So, you know, capture like 60 landmarks of the Harlem Renaissance, both institutional landmarks and figures in a compelling way in 1,200 words. Wow. Right? So so someone like me who loves series, I could have easily fallen into the trap of just making everything like, you know, sentences with like 12 commas, you know, right? (laughs) (laughs) And so I was very hyper aware of not doing that. So this became a uh, this became a, a challenge of scaffolding in a different way, not method theory, you know, lit review, but you know, institution figures, overview, context, argument, you know, because in my work I talk a lot about how the way we understand the, the Harlem Renaissance is limited. It's not just Harlem; it's all these other places. It's international. It's not just literature and art. It's also you know mass culture and politics. So how do you do all that? And still highlight the figures in 1,200 words. That was the challenge, and I think I did pretty good, you know. <laughs> um, but it, it is, it is a, it's, it's an amazing, a wonderful writing challenge. And and I, I joke, I'm like, you know, my kids don't read my books, but they'll probably read the back of this puzzle. <laughs> and and that's what drives me and makes me recognize, you know, the power. Like I said, when I was first was academic, I was like, oh, all this public facing stuff, this narrative stuff, this is all the contrived crutch. It's smoke and mirrors. But now I see it as the, the the capacity to to communicate and to reach people that you actually want to reach. Um, but there, but at the same time, there are certain things that you you won't be able to say because you don't have the space or the time or the people that that are that are your audience in that in that in that forum or for that writing piece don't have the the contextual background in the arguments. So it would take too much to get them up to speed if they're even interested in that part of the part of it. So. You know, how you the challenges of trying to do some of that work and making decisions about what really is important and what's not, what can be said, what can't, and how can you say it in a way that does more work with fewer words has been really, really interesting and exciting. Um, as far as, I, you know, like you mentioned, you mentioned, you know, lectures and keynotes and things of that nature, too. I, that gives me the chance to kind of go to my spoken word bag. You know, I think at the end of the day, I st- you know, I, I think I've. I've become a, a decent writer, but I think I'm still a, a performer, a performance intellectual. So that allows me those that that those kinds of writing allow me to do to do that. This comes up in so in the, in the digital things that I'm doing. So this is with um, I'm doing a 
12 part course for great courses. So it'll be like a, a streaming platform or where adult education learners will be able to learn about the great migration. And again, because I have to write scripts for each course and then perform them, this allows me to combine both worlds. How do you, or do you, but how do you think about teaching writing to your students? I'm pretty dogmatic about it <laughs> <laughs> because, because I didn't get it, you know, or I, I shouldn't say I didn't, I, I missed it. And no matter, and, and I wonder if I really missed it because the students that come across my, my classes, they learn writing a certain kind of way. And I think the last grip, big piece of writing that they wrote coming to me is that, that college essay to get into college. Mm -hmm. Talk about trite, like, you know, and we laugh about <laughs> it now, but you know, with these big phrases, like since the beginning of time and no one has ever done, like they learn these things about how to write these college essays and it's horrible. And so I introduced them to a certain, certain set of markers they have to hit in their writing. So I'm saying, you know, every piece of writing that you write for me has to have an opening vignette, a story, whether it's pulled from your own experience, but I, would, I discourage that, but going to the archive, going to, to newspapers, find the story of a person, the micro level that embodies the argument you want to tell and build out your your conversation with the reader from that story, from that person, from that figure, from that event or whatever. Build it out from there. Then you have to have a clear thesis statement. We all say that, right? And then I want you, you know, I go back to the old, you know, five, five paragraph essay form. And like, you got to have three themes, three sub themes. And you have to tell me what those are after your thesis. And I tell them, like, you know, like writing is like a contract. You are making a claim and you're saying to the reader that you are going to deliver that. That's your contract with the reader. And the reader has to go in. The reader goes in saying, you told me this and I'm expecting you to deliver this. And I talked to them about transitions saying you need to have like, you know, sub theme, sub, sub headings are not transitions. And you have to look at readers in an adversarial way. You have to convince them to keep reading. So you need transitions to tell them what you've done and where you're going and why they need to keep, stay along with you. You know, in a way, you know, I talk about writing like a contact sport. <laughs> like, you know, it's, it's dynamic. It's, it's something that you have to compel, convince people to come along with you for this ride. Mm -hmm. And why? And, and, and because I'm American Studies, the archive or the source material, the data, whatever you want to call it, has to be interpreted. And some, you know, in my social science colleagues, they'll have like a separate section on theory, like a theory section. Sure. And so some of my students come with, come with that training. I'm like, no, in American Studies, you want to integrate the theory within your paragraphs. The theory is a tool by which you extract meaning from your data, right? So you're not going to say... Michel Foucault or France Fanon said this and had and quote their theory, you're going to read their theory. You're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna engulf their theory. And then you're gonna demonstrate your understanding of the theory by the way in which you apply it to your materials. That's how you demonstrate knowledge of the theory. By the way you use it to extract meaning from your material, from your sources. There's no greater demonstration of your capacity to, of the theory is to take out of its original context in which you learned it and apply it to a new setting, to a new, and that's your material. And so I try to teach that. And, and that's kind of my version of scaffolding. And I hope it's been helpful, you know? I mean, but it's hard. In one class, it's a, it's, it's a writing class. It's an archive. It's a, it's a fact-gathering class. It's a theory class. It's all those things. And then I'm saying, okay, now put it all together in a writing, in a writing exercise. I wanted to ask Dr. Baldwin about a quote from a speech he gave in 2017 for the African-American Intellectual History Society. So I looked for a recording of the speech, uh, but I couldn't find one. So I'm just going to read this quote to you, but I am definitely not doing justice to his words. I'll link to the whole speech in the show notes so you can read the larger context. But here's the quote that I was interested in. Brilliance, intellect, and the profundity and blueprints of possibility fester and grow firmly within the living archives of our full range of everyday experiences no matter where these wellsprings are found, even in unexpected places. And I was just wondering if you could talk to me a little bit about that quote in the context of your writing, sort of how you see how your full range of experiences informs yeah. your writing. Number one, you can definitely see, I talked about alliteration, right? You said the profundity mm -hmm. and possibility, you know, that's my, that's my thing, right? So, um, and, I, and I delivered that speech. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> but yeah, my context, my unexpected places. Yeah. I, you know, I'm a child of the great migration. I'm the first generation to grow up 
in, in the North, in my family. Chicago's New Negroes came out of, as I said earlier, the experiences of, you know, growing up in the world before the internet, living in a small town, Beloit, Wisconsin, factory town, Beloit, Wisconsin, 35,000 people, but having broader visions and dreams of big city life, et cetera. And that being delivered to me through, you know, my mother's fashion magazines and album covers and, but also having, but even still being at home, having a sense of community, like in festivals and in, in language, you know, being kind of Beloit, being kind of an up South community. And so being Northern, but still very Southern and all those things directly impacted the way I wrote and why I wrote Chicago's New Negroes, because I went to New York to go to graduate school. And the smart thing to do is you write a book about where you're, you know, based on the material you gather from where you're going to graduate school. But I was so frustrated in New York with the living in Brooklyn and kind of the capital of the black world, but how much the vision of blackness in Brooklyn was predicated on either being West Indian or being uh, a New York, a New Yorker. But I found out about being a New Yorker was more so about migrants being from North Carolina, South Carolina, or Virginia. Mm-hmm. And the degree to which my blackness was shaped by being from the Midwest, which meant Mississippi, Arkansas, Alabama, Louisiana, Tennessee. And so just how those migration chains influenced what blackness meant. And that's pro- directly what shaped what I wrote in Chicago's and Negroes is that our understandings of the Harlem Renaissance has to be regionalized. It's not a national story. The Renaissance is a national story, but the Harlem part of it is not. And then if we go to Chicago, the focus is not on literature and art. It's on these commercial venues because Chicago is a factory town. So it's about commercial culture. It's about filmmaking and, and commercial music and beauty culture and, you know, sport, things like that. And so my personal biographies are di- directly influenced that work. I'm also a child of hip hop. So album jackets and became my gateway into a certain kind of politics that I didn't know about by reading the album covers of Public Enemy or X-Clan in in a period of Black consciousness and hip-hop music, but also being from Wisconsin again, going going to the East Coast as a a spoken word artist and um, getting no respect because we weren't, we didn't have New York City accents. Mm. And so, you know, again, all those things about album jackets and politics and region and the relationship, all these things shaped my notion of there is this connection between culture, ideas, and identity. Mm-hmm. And that's been a thread throughout all the things that I've, writ- I've written and the way that I think from an academic standpoint. And then finally, I'm a citizen of higher education. And I think that, like as you mentioned from that, from that quote, I've always tried to write from the standpoint from where I, from where I sit. I just found it. I mean, I didn't directly find it ironic, but I'm like, you know, we're talking about politics. We're talking about, you know, as scholars, we talk about foreign policy. We talk about injustices around housing, but we're silent about, you know, one of the key sites of all these issues where we were, you know, at most we might talk about labor issues on campus, but there's this, the influence of higher education institutions, which is way beyond what happens on these campuses and people aren't talking about it. What's going on? Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's naivete. Some people call call it courage. I just follow the logic of my own question. And I think that's what I've been doing throughout is that I didn't come from an academic family. My, I come from a, fa- from a family of domestics and factory workers from the Midwest. And so I didn't have the, the, the elite training of professionalization that some of my, my peers got, got before they even went to graduate school. I was amazed coming to graduate school how many people, parents or had family members that were academics mm-hmm. or in their families that being an academic was a step down, that most of their, their family members were doctors, lawyers, financiers, et cetera. And they're like, oh, that's cute. You're going to be an academic. <laughs> For me, being an academic, like, we made it, right? It's a step up. And so because I had not been professionalized, I think there were certain kinds of etiquette, spoken and unspoken, that I didn't learn. And so there's ways in which I just follow the story. Before I let you go, I want to ask you if, can you talk a little bit about what you're working on next? Yeah. So when I was writing the first book, and every book that I write has a Chicago piece in it. I'm not directly from Chicago, but it's the biggest city in it where I grew up. And as I was writing Chicago's New, Negro, New Negroes, a lot of the material that I gathered to write about that experience, because these folks didn't write about themselves, was taking Chicago school sociology studies. Mm-hmm. So the Black community in Chicago has been arguably, arguably the most studied community in the country because of Chicago school sociology. But a lot of that writing is just trash. It's horrible. It's, it's, it's borderline minstrel in its renderings. It's, it's, it's caricature. It's stereotype. It's, it's racial trauma. 
And so I had to deploy the approach of my mentor, Robin Kelly, through, you know, E.P. Thompson via my mentor, Robin Kelly, to read the sources against the grain, Mm -hmm. right? To read the sources of power against the grain. But as I was reading these materials against the grain, I was like, wait a minute, these materials have a story within themselves. Uh, You know, for so long, sociologists have been very proud to say that they were some of the, the, the first social science, the first to talk about race and to craft the idea about race. I was like, well, wait a minute. What's actually happening here is that their anxieties about race and racial difference are crafting them. Mm -hmm. And so the story for me is like not so much about what does it mean for sociology or social sciences to produce ideas about race, but what is how how did anxieties about race and racial communities produce American sociology, the American social sciences? Mm -hmm. And so that's the story that I'm telling on my next book called Land of Darkness. Chicago and the Making of Race in Modern America. That was supposed to be the second book, in what I was crafting, what I call my Urban Knowledge Trilogy. It was supposed to be Chicago through Negroes, Land of Darkness, and then in the Shadow of Ivory Tower, so moving up in time and in genre. But Land of Darkness became so urgent after the summer of, of 2020 with George Floyd and policing, and then hence my connection campus policing, that this book moved to the front. Sure. And I had some regrets about that early on, but now I think that that experience from a writing perspective is going to make this book a better book from, it's going to be more of a narrative history now that I've come to terms with that and talked about how these narratives of these different thinkers and figures, both black and white, can become windows into something that I've always wanted, I've always been obsessed with, the kind of materiality of knowledge making, the infrastructures of ideas as political economy, as community building, as interpersonal conflict and reconciliation that all these things can be routed through the individual figures and the ideas they produced. I, I wouldn't have been able to say, say that until now. You know what I'm sure. saying? That yeah. this, the, this arc of 20 years as an academic has brought me to that point. So it was, I think it was meant to be ultimately in this order of writing. And so I'm excited now. I'm write. excited too. It, it sounds <laughs> incredible. I can't wait to read it. Well, thank you so much for uh, your time and, and talking about this. Well, thank you. Thank you for, the, for you know, um, giving me the chance to talk about these things. Um, and thanks for reading the work and, and for putting me in this pantheon of, of amazing writers. Well, that pantheon is certainly a place he deserves to be. Thanks again to Dr. Baldwin for sharing so much about his writing with me. And as always, thanks to you too for listening. You can find links to the books we talked about in this episode at draftingthepast.com. And if you want to buy books by our featured writers, you can support them and the podcast at the same time by shopping through the links you find on our website. Until next time, happy writing.